<laughs> so welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Carola Schönweb. I'm one of the organizers of this uh, SIAM uh, tutorial on the foundations of uh, machine learning. Um, and uh, with me is uh, Osa Nektem, who is another uh, organizer, um, and uh, Christoph Reisinger, who is our speaker for today. And before I introduce Christoph, uh, let me just um, uh, uh, explain to you uh, about questionings. So if you want to ask a question, um, and preferably we would take all the questions at the end of the talk. If you have a very urgent question in between, um, we'll try to slot it in uh, and try to interrupt Christoph, but otherwise please wait till the end. And um, uh, to ask a question, uh, please uh, raise your hand electronically and then we will, uh, we will unmute you at the end to ask your question yourself, okay? Um, that's it, I guess. And uh, uh, to raise your hand, um, there is uh, a little um, symbol in the middle of the bottom pop-up bar to do this. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Christoph Reisinger. So Christoph is a professor of applied mathematics at the University of Oxford. He is a member of the mathematical and computational finance and data science research groups at Oxford. Uh, he's also a member of the Oxford Mann Institute of Quantitative Finance and of the Oxford Me Financial Big Data Lab. And he is a fellow of St. Catherine's College. His scientific contributions cover a broad spectrum of areas, um, such as stochastic control and PDE methods, um, with, uh, with various uh, financial applications, so for asset allocation, the calibration of local stochastic and path-dependent volatility models for derivative markets, and the simulation of interacting particle systems and filtering equations for credit risk computations. Recently, Christoph made some substantial contributions in the development of neural network-based algorithms for solving high-dimensional PDEs, uh, in particular those uh, that appear in financial applications. And this is uh, partly what he will share with us today. And I really look forward uh, to your talk, Christoph. Um, and I guess I'll hand the word over to you. So the stage is yours. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for, for having me and for the, <clears throat> the flattering introduction. Um, so I'm planning to talk about, um, as Carol said, um, about um, deep methods um, for PDs, continuing this stream of the mini symposia. And in particular, I will focus on those that um, have a link to control problems. So that's partly because um, that is important in applications. Um, so in the financial context, which I'm familiar with, um, this could relate to some um, investment problem in a large portfolio, this could relate to um, a risk management problem faced by a bank, and um, the high dimensionality here creeps in through a massive number of risk factors that have to be taken into account, um, and that leads to high dimensional state space, so in the PD context, um, extremely high dimensional PDs. It's also interesting um, because um, in the context of um, nonlinear PDs, as there are in these control settings, um, the high dimensionality is particularly punitive because um, traditional simulation methods um, tend to um, find their, their limitations. Um, so that's already um, a, a term coined by um, Bellman in the, in the 60s, the curse of dimensionality, um, which I will roughly used to understand the exponential increase in the computational effort that's needed to, um, to solve um, problems in, in, in higher dimensions. So um, it's exciting that um, recently there has been a resurgence and a complete explosion in the mathematical understanding of um, deep learning techniques. And therefore I will present you not just my own work, given this is a, um, a tutorial, um, but also summarize the work of um, others which have who have contributed, um, but in particular, I will draw on um, some applications from my own work. Um, and I mentioned my collaborators here, Alessandro Nuato, Katsufumi Ito, Athena Piccarelli, and um, Yufei Yufe Zhang. Okay. Um, I have a problem, just changing. Now you're uh, stuck somehow. 
Okay. Ah, very good. So, um, as I see it, um, I see sort of two main challenges um, in applying um, neural networks in the context of, of control problems and, and PD. So the first one is um, the an approximation theory type of result. Um, so can we approximate the value function of the control problem, the high dimensional object um, by a neural network? And neural networks are appealing um, because they're, they're, they're mesh free and so therefore there's no need um, to lay down a, a high dimensional mesh um, which is exposed to the curse of dimensionality. What makes this slightly difficult here is that um, we don't have a lot of smoothness to play with, so we are not able to use sort of abstract approximation theory results um, because in the control context, um, solutions are usually only given in the, the viscosity sense, um, so we can at most assume that they're potentially Lipschitz, Lipschitz continuous. And therefore we use um, the actual mechanics of the underlying problem, the underlying dynamics very explicitly um, to prove results about the approximation power of neural networks and often building on Monte Carlo schemes um, which are known to overcome the curse of dimensionality and then we use that as a surrogate which we fit the neural network to. So Wayne on, um, earlier this week um, he um, very succinctly sort of split the curse of dimensionality creeping in in sort of two guises. The one is um, through the choice of unset spaces we use for approximating the functions. And the, the, the second one is um, through um, the actual fitting and the, the finite number of observations. Um, so in the context of PD, that sort of translates into the problem of actually then um, fitting the neural network. And I will, I will show you here a, um, a deep colloquian type approach um, developed by, by others um, and how we can accelerate this from the sort of state of the art stochastic gradient type um, methods um, to faster convergent um, Newton method. And in the context of control problems, these are equivalent to certain policy iterations, which I'll describe. And time permitting at the end, um, I want to show you a very concrete um, application um, to um, problems in finance, in particularly risk management um, of large um, books of um, derivatives and um, using the, the, the so-called um, deep BSD solver. So just sort of to get a, get a sense of the, of the scale of the problem, if you consider, in this case, three-dimensional PD and you were to construct a mesh, um, say, with 100 um, points in each of the, of the dimensions, um, then you end up, um, of course, with, um, with a million mesh points. And you can see that um, if you add it in dimensions, um, then the scale of the problem um, explodes um, exponentially. So if you did a, a back of the envelope, computation about the complexity that you require in terms of the degrees of freedom to approximate um, a solution of a PD with a certain accuracy epsilon, and you have a method of order P available, um, say second order method, um, then um, the complexity you need um, is um, epsilon to the minus D divided by P. So higher order somehow alleviates um, the curse of dimensionality but you're still faced with an extremely large number. So if this was a hundred dimensional problem, as it will fit later, um, then you have epsilon, which is a small quantity, say 10 to the minus three, um, taken to the power of um, minus, minus 50. So, so this is a, this is a, a huge number um, by, by any standards. So of course, over the years, there has been um, a lot of research um, in dampening this curse of dimensionality. And um, one method that has proven to work well for smooth problems in moderate dimensions are so-called sparse grids, which are based on a more anisotropic um, tensor product construction. And you can see from this picture here, comparing the sparse grids where points are aligned more on lower dimensional axes and manifolds, um, you get a substantial reduction in the um, complexity compared to the full grid. And um, if you have certain mixed regularity, um, which increases with the dimension, um, you can actually prove that um, the complexity in approximation um, is then composed in a sort of epsilon term um, to the power minus one over p, so something that is dimension independent, so you lose the exponential dependence there, but you still pay the price with um, a, a dimension dependent constant and um, typically a, a, a log factor, which is also um, powered by, by, by d. So although there are some examples in uh, the literature where successfully PDs of dimensions maybe up to 20, 30 are being solved um, from my own experience to really see some asymptotic convergence of the nature that I've put on the slide. Um, you can potentially achieve that in maximum of 
six, seven, eight dimensions, even with um, constructing examples of the, of the highest possible regularity. So now, given this excitement of neural networks um, and my long running interest in these high dimensional problems, um, I it was sort of tempting um, to see um, what you can achieve um, using this type of methodology. And um, so um, just um, sketching a neural network here, um, in particular a fully connected network, um, where the complexity is roughly then given by the number of errors in this picture. So in the examples I will show you, it's actually possible to find an approximation of um, order epsilon um, with a complexity which now only increases polynomial in the dimension with a certain power c which um, often is very difficult to give explicitly um, but is no longer this exponential exponential increase um, but you get one term which is some order in epsilon plus a polynomial term in d and that is a truly fantastic and um, deep result that um, this is possible using using neural networks so to be a bit more concrete, um, so what I have in mind is um, a feed-forward neural network. Um, he illustrated for um, dimension four. So in the context of PDs, um, this would be a four-dimensional PD where we have a four-dimensional spatial vector as input into this neural network. Um, and then these um, inputs get, 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 get scrambled and mixed and transformed over a number of hidden layers um, to produce, in this case, uh, a scale output. So more specifically, um, what this neural network does, just um, to fix some notation, is that um, from one layer to the next, um, we apply two things. So first, uh, affine transformation characterized by a transformation matrix and, and a vector, and then the application of, uh, um, on your, of a universal um, activation function row, um, which is a scalar function um, from um, one layer, one layer to the next. So um, the degrees of freedom are now determined by the, the depth of the network, so that I call L, um, and the dimensions of the hidden layers. So in particular, in particular what we have to do is we have to count um, the non-zero elements of all of these matrices and, and vectors, and the number here will give us the, um, the, the complexity of this neural network, what I call um, calligraphic C here. So um, the, the results that we are sort of trying to achieve and that have been um, achieved in um, a number of um, special cases in the literature um, measures the increase in the complexity as a, as a function of D. So the, the crucial inputs here are again the, the dimension of the problem, the accuracy which we'll quantify here in terms of some, some P norms, um, and ultimately the complexity of this network counting the number of degrees of freedom. And um, in certain applications, and some of which I list here, um, it is possible to prove such a polynomial dependence. And um, in particular, in the linear case um, of linear um, parabolic PDs, um, which I want to, to start with. Um, there's um, at least um, these three papers um, by Arnold Jensen and his, his, his co-authors. Um, so first starting with um, Black-Scholes type problems. So these are in a sense um, relatives of the, of the heat equation, um, which can be um, transformed into the heat equation. So a, a linear parabolic problem with a certain structure of the of the coefficients um, where they were able to show um, that you have this, this, this type of complexity. And then in a um, somewhat related result, um, you can also get um, this complexity for parabolic equations um, for constant um, diffusion coefficients, um, but more general um, nonlinear um, first order coefficients, so sort of drift coefficients, so to speak, and Lipschitz. Um, initial data um, for, the, for the heat equation. So this is a result I want to elaborate a bit more and um, see how we can, um, can generalize this, um, which I did in recent work with um, Yufei, Yufei Zhang. So the um, problem that we have in mind, um, which is related to um, these type of parabolic equations, um, can be written in a um, stochastic representation form that um, we define a value function which maps um, a certain point x um, to the conditional expectation of a function of a stochastic process um, that I've written down here, um, conditional on starting at this point x. So you end up with a function um, which depends on, um, on, on this value. And um, so the, the particular dynamics that I have in mind is some sort of E2 process, um, where, which is characterized by a, um, a d-dimensional Baryonian motion um, multiplied by a certain diffusion matrix um, and a certain drift term. And I allow here, general nonlinear dependence of these coefficients on the underlying underlying process. So this will be the, the coefficients in my, my, my PD. 
Um, but I need some small regularizing property um, and I count this by um, introducing some positive definite matrix um, in my drifter multiplied by y. So there's a sort of a small linear um, coercive component um, which, I, which I need for the, the analysis, but I don't believe this to be crucial for the actual um, behavior of the method. So um, the link to the PD is then um, that this value function, um, this mapping from X and T um, to, the, to the solution um, is given by um, this um, linear um, parabolic equation. And um, because we allow some sort of degeneracy, um, so I'm, I'm looking at solutions in the, in the viscosity sense. Um, so in particular also con continuous solutions, um, but I'm not imposing any, any higher regularity. And in particular, the um, initial data, for instance, for the heat equation, um, they can be, um, can be non-smooth. And um, also sort of gleaning at my ultimate goal to apply this to control problems, um, I apply, a, I allow a quadratic growth um, of the, of the terminal conditions, which would be a sort of objective function in the control context. So I'm extending the, the linear context to something which allows for some, some quadratic behavior, which is important for, for instance, mean variance type problems in, in finance or any quadratic control problem. Okay, so this is the PD we have in mind and um, the result um, that you can obtain is um, the one that I already sketched earlier, that um, you can um, find um, theoretically, um, and I'm not, telling you immediately how, um, a, a neural network um, out of the family of um, feed-forward neural networks um, with um, rectified linear unit activation functions, um, which has number of degrees of freedom bounded um, by, by this term here, and which has a L2 approximation power um, smaller, than, smaller than epsilon. And um, I'm integrating this here with the unit cube um, because uh, I don't um, control the, the, the tails of the solution, um, but equally I could um, integrate over the whole space and integrate over a probability measure if that is more appropriate for the for the application. So uh, of course um, there's a lot of technical conditions that go into this and I have prepared them on the next slides um, but um, I just want to mention here that there are sort of, of two kinds. Um, one is related to the well postness of the problem so things like um, Lipschitz conditions on the coefficients, um, conditions on the um, electricity of this matrix that I mentioned. Um, and then there's another kind um, which relates to the approximability of the inputs, um, namely the terminal condition and the coefficients of the problem by neural networks. Now, that may be seen as a restrictive assumptions because I sort of kick the, the bin down the, the road um, by saying that I have to be able to approximate the input data. But in many situations, that is not a problem because either the coefficients, like in the Black Scholes case, um, have a very specific structure, or they're actually estimated from data. So in finance, um, volatility functions are often fitted to market data, in which case um, you fit some sort of piecewise linear spline. Um, so in that case, the neural network approximation is exact. Also, the initial conditions can e equally be um, piecewise linear functions. So there, there's certainly a, a wide class of problems because they're either smooth or they have a certain structure um, where the, the data that feed into this can be represented um, to the same accuracy by neural networks. Uh, and then this result says that the solution propagates this approximation and approximation power. And the way we analyze this is um, following work by, by, by Arnold Jensen and co-authors um, to first um, construct a, a Monte Carlo scheme for these condition expectations and prove that it is stable and um, um, overcomes the curse of dimensionality. Um, and, um, and then we prove that um, we can actually construct a neural network um, following a time-stepping routine um, where the complexity does not explode over time. And um, in particular, we allow in this context also um, a dependence of the coefficients on the dimension. So this can be a very non, a very stiff system um, where the coefficients um, and the norm of the coefficients um, increases polynomially with the dimension, which is again, something which is important for applications. I will skip um, the actual technical conditions and I refer you to the paper if you're interested for lockdown reading um, once you've baked all the bread and um, put the children to bed, um, if only. Um, so now you may ask um, if you're using um, Monte Carlo schemes under the bonnet, um, well, how could this possibly work um, in the nonlinear context? And um, there has been uh, groundbreaking work um, by um, a group of authors, um, which as you can see here, can be characterized by three letters, so a lot of them by uh, 
um, Martin Hutzendaler and of Jensen and Kuse, um, who've written a whole string of papers um, where they use um, a so-called multi-level Picard iteration um, to find a stochastic representation of the solution of um, semi-linear um, parabolic equations, usually of the type that I've given you here at the top of the slide, so either um, a heat equation which is perturbed by nonlinearity of the zero order type, or a gradient dependent nonlinearity. And um, the papers um, differ by um, what is being, being analyzed here. And um, in the earlier papers, um, we see the, the definition of this method um, basically um, finding a, a nonlinear version of the Feynman Katz formula to represent um, the solution of the PD, extending the, the, the linear version that I gave you earlier. Um, and in the case of the gradient nonlinearity, also using Bismuth type representation formulas um, of uh, the, the gradient by, by stochastic integrals with a, with a different, different type of kernel. Um, and then showing that a certain um, Picard iteration um, enhanced by multi-level sampling um, can actually overcome the curse of dimensionality. And um, one can then um, hope to get a step further, and um, this is what is done in this last work here um, in the gradient independent case, um, to then um, construct a neural network approximation to this um, value function um, that is represented by this um, multi-level Picard iteration for the, for the control problem. Um, so this is quite exciting, and um, so that can lead um, to, to a lot further extensions um, in this vein. As you see, a lot of this work is done extremely recently and, uh, and is moving with a, with a very fast pace. So this is exciting to follow. So while I get, instead of going into more detail here, so I wanna take a step back now and um, sort of for a bit of relaxation, I'm showing you here um, a picture. Um, that's me on a, on a lake in Newfoundland, Canada. Um, at times when we were still allowed to to travel, so um, I was just drawing out, um, trying to get to an island on this, on this lake. Um, but I eventually found myself trapped in winds that just kept blowing me to, um, to the opposite shore. Um, so when I got safe, back safely, um, I later um, discovered that um, this is actually a classical problem um, that has was already analyzed um, in the 1930s um, by Ernst Samelo. Um, about the optimal route that um, a captain would take with um, their ship in, in strong winds. Um, so casting this in a, in a more modern um, control framework, um, so I'm giving you an example of, a, of such a domain, um, so an annulus so representing the lake and the island um, with a strong wind blowing predominantly from the um, from the west in this in this situation um, and uh, meet a captain who can row at a certain maximum speed relative to the wind which is restricted by my by my muscle power um, and what I can control is therefore um, the angle um, and um, so we extend Samela's approach by including also stochasticity so the wind is not just um, deterministic but it has random bursts um, as I as I discovered. So um, Casting this um, problem now um, in a sort of game situation, um, I'm picturing the wind as this evil adversary um, who's trying to make my life as, as hard as possible. Um, and I try to minimize the time to um, exit the lake on um, preferably the island, but if I can't do that, then on the, on the shore where I came from. Um, by, by choosing the direction of my, of my rowing um, in the worst case scenario um, that the wind poses. So it's a two player game. Um, I'm the inf player trying to um, minimize an exit time here written as tor the exit time um, from the domain starting from a certain point x. Um, under a certain choice of um, controls alpha by me and beta by the, by the wind. And um, so if f was equals to one here, then this integral just um, boils down to the, to the exit time. And um, I include a, a certain term g here, which is um, a function of the point of exit, um, which allows me to model the preference for exit at certain parts of the domain. Now, writing this as a, as a stationary control problem, um, applying dynamic programming, um, I can write the value function as a, a solution of a, a semilinear um, equation here, um, so-called hamilton jacobi bellman Isaac's equation where the Isaac's um, reflects the, um, the, the game situation. And um, by way of notation, um, um, 
double the indices here um, are meant to be summed over. So I'm adopting a summation convention that I sum over any index that appears in the coefficients and in the derivatives here. So that is a sort of elliptic um, linear operator in the first term, and then the nonlinearity comes from the control of the drift term. So I have a Hamiltonian given by this, this max min term here, um, where the coefficients um, depend, on, depend on these controls. So um, reviewing now um, ways of solving this PDE. Um, so in this particular application, I have the two-dimensional equation, but um, it's preferable to um, generalize this to a, a multi-dimensional setting. Um, so I want to review a class of methods called deep Golokin methods, um, which have been analyzed um, recently by Justin Siriniano and um, Spiliopoulos here, um, but they date back to more heuristic um, versions of the method in the engineering literature. Well, basically, um, you um, make an ansatz for the solution, for instance, by a family of neural networks parameterized, again, by, say, the matrices and vectors in my feedforward neural network. And then I plug these ansatz um, into, the, into the differential operator. And if I get zero on the right-hand side, then I was lucky to get the right solution. But generally, um, you will encounter residuals. So the method is now based in minimizing this residual over the parameter of my ansatz space. So having chosen um, a certain class of neural networks, um, you have to minimize um, the residual in the interior of the differential operator, plus the term um, which measures the deviation of the boundary conditions. So I've reduced my PDE to a um, finite dimensional optimization problem. In related work, um, if the differential equation itself already has a variational structure, then you can formulate the minimization problem over your answer space directly. Um, or it's also possible um, to use the control structure of the problem more directly and not parameterize the, the value function, but actually parameterize the, the controls themselves. And then by stochastic simulation, simulate um, scenarios under a given choice of control and then optimize over their control. So there, there, there's different guises of, of this type of idea. Now, um, in practice, of course, um, we can't evaluate the norm of the residual often directly um, because you'd have to integrate over high dimensional space. Um, and although that may be possible for simple um, neural networks, um, in terms of generality, it's a good idea to um, do this numerically. So um, you could, for instance, use Monte Carlo samples um, to avoid any curse of dimensionality creeping in, or in low dimensions, you could just use some quadrature rule. So we, in particular, used um, quasi-random numbers, pseudo-random numbers um, with low discrepancy, which allow us to exploit some sort of higher regularity and still get satisfactory convergence, even in, in higher dimensions. So once you've written down your empirical cost functional here, um, you then have to solve the optimization problem. And the standard way to do that would be by um, some, some gradient descent um, to account for the possibly large number of parameters, which may make um, second order methods, methods prohibitively expensive. Um, and then because um, you have a uh, in each iteration, um, you have a large sum over the samples to evaluate um, by stochastic gradient descent. You subsample um, a small set to determine the up-to-date direction in each, in, each, um, in each step. Now, this approach um, is appealing because um, it does not require to design a mesh in high dimensions. Um, and therefore, with what we now know about the approximation power of neural networks, um, as the lure that it may give us reasonable complexity also in high dimensions. Um, but it also has um, a lot of complications um, in practice, that is the, um, the optimization problem. Um, so even if you already have a convex or linear PD, the optimization through the neural network is, is non-convex. Um, stochastic gradient descent um, is extremely slow. Um, and also um, in the context of our control problem, because we initially imposing only boundary data in a, in a weak sense, um, it is not clear that um, we get the required regularity of the solution in the interior that we can back out to optimal controls. And that is often the, the ultimate goal. So um, to extend this, um, we um, applied a, a higher order iteration method. Um, so in particular, a Newton type method, um, which can be written 
as an iteration over the policies and the value function in the, in the setting of, of control problems. So um, in each iteration, we perform um, two steps. Um, in the first step for a current guess of the value function, we work out um, the, the two optimal responses of the two players. So we um, work out the optimal response of the, of the min player to the max player's chosen action. Um, and then we work out the optimal, the optimal strategy of the max player, assuming that the, the min player has chosen the optimal, um, the optimal strategy. So, and then um, we plug that into the, into the PD, we plug that into the coefficients and um, given a certain choice of controls, we solve a linear PD. And then we iterate um, the solution of this linear PD gives us a new guess for the value function. Um, and based on this value function, we again work out the optimal feedback controls of the two players. And um, it is shown in some context in finite dimensions um, that you get nice monotone convergence in the, the setting of, of control problems where you have um, convexity and monotonicity. So now the situation, um, the, the overall strategy is that um, we apply this um, iteration as an outer iteration in the function space, um, which allows us to get results which are robust under refinement of the neural network. And then we apply the stochastic gradient, sorry, the, um, the, the deep Golokin method to the, to the linear PD, um, and we solve the linear PD by stochastic gradient descent as an, as an inner iteration. And we will see in the test um, that that allows us to accelerate um, the convergence quite, quite rapidly. So um, having said that, um, because um, we can't solve these linear PDs in each iteration exactly, um, we have to account for the, the error that we make um, and we formulate this as an inexact um, policy iteration. So we formulate um, the, the deep Golokin method um, in each step to find an update, um, UK plus one, given our previous guess for the solution and for the controls by looking at um, a penalized um, residual of the equation. Um, so in particular, because we're interested in um, working out the controls, which can be written in terms of the derivatives that enter the PD, we're interested in um, first and second derivatives of the solution. So we formulate this um, problem in H2, so the space of functions with two weak derivatives. Um, that allows us to control the residual of the equation in L2, um, but um, the correct trace operator um, in this setting is then um, the space H3 half on the boundary. So we deviate slightly from the, the, the common framework um, to impose higher regularity on the boundary to ensure enough regularity for the controls. And um, so it turns out that um, if we solve um, the linear problem within each iteration to a required accuracy, which is measured by um, the size of the update and a certain factor eta k, which will be crucial, then we can recover superlinear convergence. So if we reduce this um, um, sort of error measure substantially enough um, from one iteration to the next, such that um, this factor eta k goes to zero, then we get a number of nice properties. Namely that um, we get superlinear convergence as you would hope for for a Newton type method. So um, in practice, you would um, hope to get quadratic convergence, um, but in any case, you can prove um, superlinear convergence in this context. Um, and um, building on this fast convergence, we can actually show convergence of the derivatives as well. And that doesn't only hold in a weak sense, um, but it holds point mice almost everywhere in the domain, which is, a, which is a very strong result. And in particular, given the structure of the control problem, it allows us to then find the optimal controls by an optimization routine, or in particular, they are also part of the um, solution from the policy iteration, and therefore we can just use our final policies um, as guesses for the optimal control um, and we get convergence of convergence of those. So that is the practically perhaps most important bit that we don't just approximate the PD solution, but um, ultimately you want to execute the control algorithm for which you need the, the alpha and the beta. So coming back to my, my um, predicament on the lake. Um, so if I now um, apply this to this situation um, and I try to 
minimize my exit time with a certain preference to go to the, to the island. So setting um, the boundary condition zero there and a boundary condition of one on the, um, on the outer circle, which is my secondary choice. Um, I get a certain strategy um, here that um, remember the wind came from the, from the west. Um, so um, if I'm uh, west of the island, um, then I just row towards the island and the wind blow me there, blows me there. Whereas I'm on the right, um, if I'm sufficiently close, even if um, my rowing is slower than the speed of the wind, so in a normal scenario, um, it would blow me in the opposite direction, I can sort of hope for bursts of the wind through the stochastic fluctuation that I can make a dash for the island. Whereas if I'm too far away, then I accept my fate and I, I just row to the outside of the lake. So this is an in intuitive strategy. From a, from a mathematical perspective, I'm more interested in the, the convergence of a method. And I already indicated there's a, um, a crucial choice to be made about um, the accuracy by which we solve the inner problem by stochastic gradient descent. And I'm showing you here two extreme scenarios. Um, one where the accuracy is um, extremely high. So if I show you the residual of the equation over the number of iterations, the red line um, gives you a rapid convergence over a very small number of iterations recovering the super linear convergence of the, of the Newton method. Whereas if I allow myself too much wiggle room and I only apply stochastic gradient descent um, without waiting for asymptotic convergence, um, then I'm still exposed um, to a lot of, a lot of noise from, from my solution. In practice, of course, um, the optimum will sit somewhere in between because there's no point investing a ridiculous amount of iterations to solve an approximate problem um, with too high accuracy, but at the same time, you wanna benefit from the superlinear convergence. So I have to invest um, enough complexity to um, solve the inner linear PD problems um, accurately enough. So, um, to end with, um, I want to show you um, one other application um, of um, neural networks in um, high dimensional problems, um, which was motivated by um, a, a huge problem that many financial institutions face um, in the aftermath of the 2008-2009 um, credit crisis, um, where they have to manage the um, default risk um, of counterparties that they're exposed to, um, which is aggregated over the whole book of the banks. So banks will have books of a large number of financial derivatives. Um, in this case, I'll be looking at um, so-called European options. Um, and um, they, on the one hand, have to, to hedge and price these options, and on the other hand, to, to measure the risk of um, any of the counterparties um, going bust and them not uh, recovering the cash flows that, um, that, that they expected. And on top of that, um, there's issues of, of funding these transactions. Um, so there's a lot of market frictions that come on top of what I just said. So um, without going into too much financial jargon, um, so the, the situation is um, that you often have some, some value of a derivative, um, which can be written as an expectation of a function of an underlying stochastic process modeling um, some risky financial asset. Um, which lives in a d-dimensional space. So think of this as a large vector of equities, interest rates, exchange rates, um, all sorts of traded instruments. Um, and by a, a classical hedging argument, um, you will see that um, the, this condition expectation satisfies um, a stochastic differential equation, um, where this factor z here um, is um, typically uh, related to the, to the gradient of um, of the value function of these, of these options. Um, but it is also the control that um, the, um, the risk manager wants to take um, to replicate the uncertain payoff, which is a function of the underlying, underlying asset. And ultimately, um, the bank has a, has a large book, um, so we're interested in a, in, in a large sum of derivatives of this, of this kind. Um, so the, the first problem is the one of um, finding these um, processes Z, um, which hedge these options um, and um, finding the initial value of Y, which would then be the value of this derivative. So um, those of you familiar with BSDs will have already spotted the structure um, that um, this um, smells like a backwards stochastic differential equations in the sense that um, 
we are trying to um, control this process Y here by choosing this hedging process Z um, so as um, to steer the process to a desired terminal terminal distribution which is given exogenously um, by the model for X and the function G applied to it. So um, therefore this falls squarely into the type of methods um, that have been proposed by E. Han and Jens um, uh, a, a couple of years ago um, where they um, try to solve um, BSDs exactly by a parameterization um, of this process Z um, assuming a Markovian structure so assuming that um, the Z is chosen as a function of the underlying processes X and potentially potentially Y. Um, so in a time discretized version um, that we can easily simulate, um, we would have a forward component, the process X, um, which uh, whose dynamics is given by the, the underlying model, um, and the process Y, um, which um, is approximated in its dynamics by a neural network representation of um, the process Z as a function of X. Um, and um, we choose a certain parameterization um, using, for instance, again, a feedforward neural network, where rho here represents um, the, the hyperparameters. And um, ultimately what we can do is um, we can um, approximate the expectation of a, of a least squares difference between Y at the final time and, um, and the simulated um, process X um, sitting in the function G. Um, and we, we minimize the discrepancy here over choosing on the one hand the hyperparameters of our neural network. So this is the control component um, and the initial value um, zeta here, which is the initial value of Y um, by some sort of a shooting method, um, which would be the initial value of this financial derivative. So um, showing you a particular application. So one derived quantity that um, Banks interest is interested in is a so-called um, expected positive exposure, which is the, the positive part um, of the future value of these derivatives, um, which is a measure for um, the risks they face um, if somebody cannot actually honor the, um, the obligation to, to, um, this, to this payoff. Um, and um, if we um, approximate this um, by um, a neural network, in this case with three hidden layers and 110 nodes, so not too much complexity, we see that um, in the case of, uh, of a basket option, so in which case um, we have a 100 dimensional driving SD um, and a payoff which depends on these 100 factors um, equivalent to a 100 dimensional PD, um, we can see that we get um, in initial tests a reasonable accuracy compared to a Monte Carlo benchmark um, which lies around 300 and 97, 398 in this case, and the, the BSD solver gives us something that is, that is quite similar. The financially um, exciting thing about this is that um, we don't just get the initial value, but we can simulate um, these derivative prices in future scenarios as well. Um, and that allows us to compute further risk measures. And let me just mention um, one extension that we've been working on, um, which is um, formulating um, BSDs um, for so-called valuation adjustments, which banks have to add to the idealized value of derivatives to account for market frictions like credit risk, funding risk, et cetera. And um, it is seen in a, a string of um, work over the last decades um, that these can be written as um, additional BSDs, um, which take the previous solution from a first BSD as input. And then on top of that, uh, and solve a new BSD um, to find um, these values. And then you might be interested again in gradients of the solution to this BD, BSDs to hedge the sort of secondary risk of these, of these market frictions, et cetera, et cetera. So um, th th there's a lot of um, practically extremely important applications um, that one can, um, can analyze here. So uh, this brings me to the end of my talk. Um, so um, where I'd like, wanted to, um, outline to you um, a number of complementary um, challenges and potential avenues to solutions. Um, one of them being the approximation of the solutions by neural networks um, where there's some exciting results on the expression power. Um, but then also the challenge of actually finding the neural network, even if you know that it exists, um, which has to be done by some complex nonlinear iterations and um, we have some promising results that some high order methods um, applied in a more abstract functional setting can be used to enhance um, the state of the art methods. 
and um, all of this can also feed into um, financial applications such as um, that of counterparty credit risk. So I'd like to end here and um, look forward to questions. Thanks a lot, Christoph, for a fascinating talk. Thank you very much and also very well timed. I'm uh, impressed. Um, questions. So uh, just to remind everyone, if you could raise your hand. Okay, we already have a question. That's very good. Okay, that's Yuri. Let's see if I can allow to talk. Yuri, you should be able to talk now if you unmute yourself. Uh, oh. Okay. Hello? Yes. Hi, I can hear you. Can you hear yes, me? We can. Yes, we can. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, very interesting. I've got one question. Uh, on uh, Tuesday, we heard from Wai Nan Yi that uh, to each type of neural networks that corresponds a function space uh, of functions which can be uh, approximated with this type of neural networks, like those baron spaces, for mm -hmm. example. Now, if you want to have a, uh, a neural network ansatz for your PGE, you mm -hmm. probably need to know that the solution of this PGE is in that space. Are there any results in this direction? Um, yeah, that, that, that is a good question. Um, that's one that um, uh, we have bypassed um, here entirely um, because um, we're working here. You, you're absolutely right. So you can envisage um, an analysis where you say your solution lies in a certain space, it's twice differentiable or so, and then you can look at approximation results um, within the space of, of these functions. Um, but um, what we've done here is um, that um, we construct the, the neural network more directly um, from the stochastic representation, um, where we just work with the evolution of the underlying stochastic processes and the Euler approximations um, to show that we can construct a neural network with that accuracy. Um, and um, in that sense, um, we're not explicitly using any regularity um, what, whatsoever. Um, the, the price we pay is um, that the analysis is extremely cumbersome. And um, so although I have showed you these abstract results um, that you have a certain polynomial um, complexity, um, it's already very difficult to tease that out, out of your method. Um, and, and it would be even harder to, to get um, sharp results. So um, we haven't tried numerically to see um, if you, by constructing some very careful examples, whether you'd be able to estimate um, what, the, what the order is, um, which you're ultimately interested in. And things are really quite subtle because um, if you talk about the um, curse of dimensionality, you have to um, say how you construct the dimension dependence of your, of your PD. And, um, and Wayland has a, um, a deep way of thinking about this in, in, in terms of certain bearing spaces, et cetera. But um, in applications, it would be then, then relevant to, to see is this, um, uh, a viable assumption to, to make. Um... Okay, thank you very much. Super, thank you. So while uh, others are thinking, um, Christoph, um, what do you, if I understood you correctly, um, what, what are you doing if you don't have a closed form solution for your PDE? Mm -hmm. What do you do in this case? Um, okay, um, in in terms of the assessing the accuracy, or in, so so what do you? Um, okay, so that that is an interesting question. Um, whether you can get potentially some um, a posteriori error estimates, so that would be an interesting question to have. Um, so in the, in the actual method, we're not um, we're not using exact solutions. We're only using certain certain ansatzes by by, by neural networks. Um, but yeah. if you are interested in it, um, then, then quantifying the error um, for the um, deep Galoikian method, um, one can prove convergence if you have certain well postness of the PDE that um, if you have a bound on your residual. Um, you may be able to translate this into a bound of the a bound of the error. Mm -hmm. Also, very interesting in the context of the deep BSD solver. Um, there is, in some situations, um, a very nice um, uh, dual result um, by Pierre Henri Labordier, where um, he formulates a dual problem to the control problem. Um, so, um, and he exploits the fact that um, any control that you can choose is uh, by nature suboptimal. So for the primal problem, um, you get, say, if it was a maximization problem, you um, automatically get a lower bound. Uh, 
Whereas if you look at the dual problem, um, it's um, equivalently easy or not to construct an upper bound. So um, in that case, you get computable upper and lower bounds. And um, if you're not happy with them, um, then you can increase the complexity of your trial space um, for representing the control and you can try to bring it down. Um, but these are actually subject to maybe sampling error. They are, they are computable bounds. Um, so that is also exciting whether one could um, extend this to, to further problems. Okay, 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 interesting, thank you. Um, so we have uh, the hand raised by Thomas Torku. <coughs> All right, Thomas, you are permitted to speak now. All right, thank you. Um, quick question um, in reference to uh, what what Professor Wena he said on Monday uh, re regarding case of dimensionality. He made mention of spectral methods as well as particle methods in terms of um, Monte Carlo and stuff. And he also used the same here. What is the rationale of using the Monte Carlo for uh, as a way of overcoming the case of dim um, dimensionality. Okay, so um, so so I guess um, the well the simple answer is uh, so Monte Carlo methods have long been praised um, for being fairly dimension independent. So if you're interested in only um, the solution of say a heat equation um, at a particular point, um, you can use the equivalence to um, to, to Brownian motion um, to just simulate um, a lot of trajectories from the same initial point and estimate an expectation and the error that you have is purely um, sampling error which um, converges with um, some, some, some central limit theorem. So um, you can um, get a certain accuracy um, independent of the dimension and um, so now if you have a high dimensional process, um, you would have a scaling that is, that, that is linear. Um, so I think when neural networks come in now is um, that if you want to get um, this value function um, for, for um, all values of X. Um, so then you can use this nice feature of the Monte Carlo simulation to then fit a neural network um, to your Monte Carlo solution and show that um, you can do that with the same complexity. So we use that sort of as a surrogate model, um, which allows us to analyze the complexity of the, of the neural network. All right, thank so, you. Yeah. Super. Yes, but maybe Thanks. I can say that, um, that there's also more direct ways of, of using also Monte Carlo methods um, for um, Nonlinear PDs, you mentioned um, uh, particle methods, um, so there's, there's very nice um, methods where you, um, where you split particles um, and um, you can um, also directly represent um, solutions of nonlinear non PDs um, by, by, by simulation um, in certain situations. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. So uh, we have one more question from Hai Liang Liu. Uh, can he be unmuted? Great. Okay. Hi, Liang, you are permitted to talk now if you wanted to. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I just wonder you use a network to produce a function uh, for solving the parabolic PDEs, but how do you typically evaluate the gradients or derivatives involved mm -hmm. in, the, in the residual you, you try to minimize? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the, the, yeah, that is obviously a very good question. And so um, we, um, in our example, um, we used um, simple trial spaces uh, um, for the, um, the game situation um, where we were interested in second derivatives. Um, we, we used uh, some smoothed version of the Wheeler functions, um, like in arc 10, et cetera. So, um, and in that case, um, painfully, but um, you can um, just work out the derivatives by, by hand. Um, so, so that's certainly something you can do um, if you choose your, your trial functions uh, appropriately. Um, otherwise, um, you can also use um, automatic differentiation tools, um, for instance, um, to compute these. Um, and in particular, in the context of um, a lot of input parameters, um, it's appealing to use um, adjoint methods, um, which then allow you to compute the, the gradients um, over a very large number of parameters within a very small factor of the complexity of just evaluating the neural network. So, so that would be the way forward in a more more abstract, abstract way. So, so, uh, so then in that case, uh, so uh, how do you evaluate the, uh, say, you, 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 you know, you, you minimize that. So how do you control the, uh, the step of iteration in doing the minimization so that you see that the result already 
uh, good enough? You're happy with that? So pretty much you need to do, do optimization, you know, iteration like SGD or yes. whatever you do. <laughs> Um, so, so you mean the, the, the termination criterion of your iteration? Yeah, your so termination in, in the case, um, you but, to stop, yeah. But what I, what I showed you here, sorry, um, there, there's sort of, yeah, two, two answers to this uh, in terms of the, um, the, the, the outer iteration, my, my Newton iteration, um, I have a termination criterion, yeah, based on the, based on the residual, for instance, or you could also base it on the, on the, on the update. Um, um, and then, um, as I showed you, so it's crucial also for, for solving the linearized problem, um, you also have to somehow carefully control um, the, the error in this case. And um, that is a subtle point, um, so which is reflected in the choice of this eta k here. So the accuracy of um, the, the linear PD measured by, by its residual and boundary condition. Um, and uh, against um, the, 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 the previous step and um, so, so, so choosing um, this fact that eta k uh, has, has a big impact um, in terms of the complexity of number of iterations that you need for the in iteration, but also the speed of, of convergence um, as, I, as I showed you in this, in this, in this plot here. Um, so, so there's a trade-off to be made and um, that is a bit of experience um, for a particular application, how you, how you do that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so if there are no further questions, uh, thanks a lot again, Christoph. This was okay. really a great talk, was a great finish of this uh, week's tutorial. Uh, and uh, just to remind everyone, we are going to continue next week with three more talks by Ozan Oktam, uh, Rebecca Willett and uh, Lexing Ying. Uh, and next week will be a bit more on um, machine learning and inverse problems. Um, and some of the foundational aspects and results that we have so far on that topic. So thank you so much for joining and thanks a lot, Christoph. This was great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.